Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 95. In the show, we talk about the SKA coming to South Africa, fixing South Africa's interwebs, and the godfather of Gibbs VR headset. Thank you for watching. Good evening and welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 95. We are so close. So close. In the show with me tonight, we have... We're very far away from 128. I'm 128. <laughs> and... I'm Tim Hawk. And I'm Gareth, as I've said before. And, yeah, straight into our events. Random. Oh, our random. Correct. Uh, so, so... What's the random for the week? So, the random was me. And during development, there was a version of Windows, referred to as Windows 4.0, or by its internal code name, Chicago. Guess which windows it is. And if you've seen the slide... 98. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Has to do with the episode number. Yeah, so Windows 95 uh, for episode 95. I'm very sorry. This was, this was uh, one, of, you know, one of those Microsoft iterations. It's always they, in, they, they revamp the product, and it's not quite what they promised it would be. And then they fix no, it with the following version. 95 was okay, and, and 98 was okay. It's the next one. M -E. That was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it, 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 of all of them, that is, had, to my view, has been the worst version of Windows ever yeah. produced. So now, what's notable about what, what Microsoft did with Windows 95 is that until then, Windows really ran as a shell. Uh, there was always a joke um, that Windows is nothing but a 16-bit shell running on an 8-bit operating system uh, from a 2-bit company or something <laughs> to that effect. Um, and and not, 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 not 640 bits. <laughs> yeah. kilobit. And, and that was really what Windows was. It was really just a shell that ran on top of DOS. And Windows 95 still ran on DOS, but it, it sort of merged the two worlds. You could still run DOS 6.22 and Windows 95 on top of that, but um, all of a sudden, you know, the, the two were a little less distinguishable. And then with the advent, I think, of the NT kernel, they yeah. did away with the explicit DOS underpinnings um, and just had like a, a straight a up integrated point. operating system. But this was the beginning of that integration between the two worlds. Now, this was still uh, the non-commercial one. Um, and then it was the 2000 where they integrated a lot of this stuff with in NT. NT. Yeah. Um, well, there was NT5, NT4 and 5. Before 2000, I think. You no, guys remember that? No, well, I, I no. never came across that. I only came across these not working in, uh, in the corporate environment yeah, where yeah. it was. Mm. Um, a, uh, a, a comment from IRC is that ME was fine for them. They had no problems. And I must say, I had the same experience. Yeah, same. We actually ran Windows ME. We, um, we ran ME, and then we switched over to XP, and then we switched back to ME. Uh, I remember that stage. I, I, I switched to XP and I went back to ME. Going to ME and then going back to 98. No, actually, <laughs> then going to NT or something. I did the same thing. ME 98, then back to ME, and then XP I stuck with. It oh wasn't okay. like, you, like you regressionists. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> From that to our events. Uh, I see we don't have a lot on the events uh, schedule, but okay. check out stardates.co.za. And if you have anything to uh, just notify us, send us an email, send us a tweet. Dates at... Let's talk network TV. That'll work. And then we can put it in. Um, there is one thing happening this week for the Joe Burgers. Uh, Ubuntu Hour in Johannesburg. And it's going to be at the Mall of Rosebank, uh, the Mug and, Mug and Bean Mall of Rosebank, on Saturday from 12 to 2. What's Ubuntu Hour? It's just a bunch of Ubuntu people, Ubuntu users, Ubuntu developers. Getting Ubuntu together. the operating system. Yes, Ubuntu the operating about system. Everybody getting together and just feeling good about one another's company. No. Community. <laughs> yes, this is about Ubuntu, the operating system community, getting them together, bring your laptop if you want to, uh, bring stuff and talk Ubuntu for an hour. In this oh. case, two hours. Should be lots of fun. I know there's also the Random Hacks of Kindness happening at UNISA. Yeah? Is um, that this week? Yeah, it's also, okay. I saw the second, I think you remembered, uh, with uh, House for Hacker involved. Mm -hmm. um, also, but I think they're pretty much booked up. They had a a smaller space, which then the amount of people grew, so they got a slightly bigger space, and then the amount of people grew quickly again, and they got to a point and said, well, pretty much we're going to close it soon. Uh, though, having said that, uh, there's going to be a science hack day coming up. I know the guys are meeting up with some people next week, Wednesday, to discuss when it is, and when we have more feedback, we'll get back to you. Mm. Um, and we are reminding folks about uh, Rage, the really awesome gaming expo so long, which is um, organized by Tide Media, the guys behind NAG, every year. Um, and that's really just to start priming you for September 
uh, uh, actually for, I think, August when the, when the land tickets go on sale. If you're interested in attending that land, last year they sold out in like two hours. Mm -hmm. When those tickets go live, you want to be in line to buy them. Um, so we'll keep reminding you. So, so we'll nag people about it. Indeed. Well done. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be... <laughs> It's going to be pun night. Oh, Sorry. no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, straight into our topics then. Opera's doing some bad things. Oh. Or are they contemplating doing well, some bad things? Do tell. It's not, it's not opera necessarily. Well, yeah, it's not opera doing. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and nobody's really saying, I mean, obviously, I think a move like this would have to be initiated from the, the more expensive person or the, the, the guy with a high the market cap, yes. which some is background. Facebook. Yes. All right. So uh, there are rumors that Facebook is looking at buying opera. Ugh. All right, so for a billion dollars, <laughs> they just have billions of dollars lying around there. It seems yeah, well, they do now. To just shell out. Um, well, th think of the, the big, who are the big four IT companies? Microsoft, Google, Apple, Oracle, Apple, and Facebook. Well, where do we rank Oracle in those yeah, guys? Where's, so where's Oracle? <laughs> they, they mark, the, these guys' market caps are quite a bit above Oracle. I don't know about, well, market cap, I think it specifically refers to things like share price and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, and Facebook only just listed. And, apparently they're, and they're not doing so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> well, so I'd have to relook that. But yeah. Um, but if you look at it, Microsoft has a browser. Apple has their own browser. Google has their own browser. You know, Facebook just wants to join the game. <laughs> and, uh, and Facebook, um, just like Google, is offering a service um, in the online space. And Google also kind of decided, however, Google, I feel, at least had a leg to stand on. Google was going, guys, the web is moving on and the browser makers aren't, yeah. aren't stepping up to the yes. plate. And so Google is like, this is what we want from a browser. And it wasn't actually meant to be, it was meant to be like a Nexus phone. It's like, it's, th this yeah, is it what, you, what we want you to do with the, the new version th of this Android. This is an example and it's yes. supposed to spur you on. Not, we're not going to get any like more about board it. that you get yeah. from AMD and NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is not the best you can do, but this is the minimum we expect from you. Do it now. And now they have the lion's share of yeah, the browser cap. Exactly. Now, now uh, Google is encroaching heavily on Internet Explorer space. Internet Explorer still dominates. So if Facebook just wants to buy a browser, it seems odd to buy the complete underdog. Um, well, where else could you buy? Where Opera is, yeah, and where Opera is stro really strong is the mobile space. You don't yeah. necessarily have to buy. They could go for something WebKit and build their own from that. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is the article I linked to in the show notes, and uh, let's bomb it into the IRC for the guys to read, um, is that uh, says that the real reason, and this is an analysis opinion type piece, that Facebook w might be looking, I mean, they also don't confirm anything. It's all rumor and conjecture right now. Mm. Might be looking at Opera is actually for its ad serving segment um opera has uh, as the as you can see from the the slide um has a significant uh you know foothold in the, the the online ad serving space and so that might be something that they're looking at that that kind of expertise that they're looking at acquiring um and, uh, and look there's there's quite a couple of nice things also about the browser and i just think you at the top this compression um look they you also they can run it in the own mail which is a very blackberry way of running it mm -hmm. Um, so if you tie that in with, with phones, you get much uh, better experience on the thing. And the one really thing I really like in the one is you can run a browser inside your browser. Yeah, you can run a, a web server inside your browser. Oh, yes, Opera Unite, uh, um, which is not just the web, uh, a web server. It's a whole bunch of things that you can build on top. It's a whole platform for building on top of things that can run in your browser. Mm. Mm. It's, it's the one thing I keep on wishing browsers would add because you can then do some scarily awesome into uh, browser to browser communication stuff like that mm. obviously it allows a lot of hacking it's a big problem but <laughs> it would be awesome but it <laughs> also allows a lot of fun hacking yeah but <laughs> you could do decent chat clients then you could uh, as in peer-to-peer -peer chat clients mm -hmm. uh, you could do distributed hosting of websites mm -hmm. so basically as one person pulls your site down they can share it with another person it's just some very cool things you could do with it mm. um that's just me wanting. It's <laughs> the thing I want. That and audio fixed in uh, browsers, and specifically mobile browsers. Yes, yes. Because uh, they're, they're looking at video, uh, and there's there's a bit of a battle between the video codecs of HTML5. Well, um, but audio, video, and with Canvas and SVG, you can do quite nice moving graphics and stuff mm, like that. Mm. But but the audio things, you've got to fall back to Flash, flash. to play audio Oof. with it. So I did that. And if you want to edit audio, because there are some really interesting things being done online 
in, in terms of editing media. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it's all being done in Flash. Well, actually, in fact, with some of the codecs that are coming in that uh, Mozilla is working on, which I think I have a feeling Chrome might have it in now already, you can do a lot of audio processing stuff in the Chrome browser and with Mozilla's browser with the new HTML5 specs. My main problem is it hasn't hit the mobile browsers yet. So all these mobile games you want to do that you want to remove from Flash, great graphics, you can do all that, and then you get let down by the sound. Um, I've just been informed in IRC, uh, and I have no reason to doubt the man, that Opera is apparently killing Unite with version 12 and on. Um, there are, there are, there's apparently a big outcry among Opera fans. Um, uh, apparently the, the, the 12 beta is out, and it's not making fans happy. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll definitely have a look. Yeah, yeah. Um, as well. Uh, I mean, South Africa is a big bastion, especially of Opera Mini. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're Again, uh, because of, as to mention, the compression. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, we, we are a big user of Opera Mini in South Africa, so it, it is good to keep tabs of what mm. Opera is doing. And I've always been a fan, though. I've, uh, I've switched over to Chrome for everything else because it just syncs so beautifully with the rest of my life. Uh, but Opera has always been very, very nice to use. I've always... I haven't... Hated using it like C you can hate I using IE or Safari. Can I put a left field idea in here? Blackberries work well because you've got this compression in a phone. It's all slight rumors that uh, Facebook is looking at a new phone. With the uh, del content delivery service that Opera has, mm -hmm. it will make a very good, nice pairing. Perhaps, but they're also in sort of it's sort of competing technologies. When you buy two companies and ask ask from somebody who's uh, been at a company that does this. Um, when you buy two companies with competing technology, the, the two factions just end up warring. And I don't know if there's, there is a way from a managerial level to go, Opera, you are now working on RIMS tech. You, you're Sorry. not allowed to use your no, tech. No, no, no. I'm not saying that you buy RIMS tech. You use the Opera and the way Opera delivers content to provide. You don't buy RIM. You, you get some other... Phone manual. Oh, because there's a rumor that they're looking at buying room. I, I know way. that's one of the things, but <laughs> you then use um, Opera's, the way Opera works and the way it compresses things and all the services to deliver what room delivers. So you get all the compression thing, which are cool, uh, with a better browser. Um, and Facebook. you just, you, you tie that into your phone. And then Facebook already has the cameras and the imaging technology, thanks Instagram. <laughs> they already have the chat, thanks Facebook. So there's, there's a lot there, actually. Without um, you pretty much got foil hats on. <laughs> Look, I don't think it's going to happen, but yeah, it's it's <laughs> moving along. Uh, no cost desktop software is dead for Windows 8, or at least that's what it's starting to look like. Before but we even go here, does anybody want Windows 8? No, no, not, no. Not, not anymore. And after reading this, no, definitely not. So, what I'm going on about with no cost desktop software is dead for Windows 8 is if you wanted to develop. Uh, for Windows 7 or, or some, yeah, for, for say Windows 7, and you wanted to do it freely on the cheap, something open source or, or you know, something along those lines, you'd go for Visual Studio Express, um, C 2010 or C Sharp 2010 Express, and you can do it in that. It's free, off you go. And with the new Visual Studio, um, they won't be able to, to uh, create command line or desktop side apps in the Express versions of Visual Studio anymore. So you will only be able to create Metro apps, which have to be, they, they can't be sideloaded. So those have to be then put, it, put into the store, which up to date has cost you $99 per year, similar to Apple. And that's the end of that. So you have to be making Metro apps. There's so no other way to make desktop or command line apps. This is them forcing you to make Metro apps. Yes. But even then, I even if you're making Metro apps, it's still not free. You yeah, still have to pay the $99 because you can't sideload those apps. You can't put them on some website somewhere and just tell people to download Or even share it with it. your friends. Or share it you, you can't do that with a Metro app. Um, and the only option you really have is stick with the old Visual Studio, uh, or you have to shell out 400 to $500 for the next Visual Studio. HTML5. Sorry. Except that's not a desktop or a command line app. That's a web app. Yeah, but with most of these things, you can now do it more HTML5. In a weird way, they're forcing people to actually do it. Which I don't think that's actually the intention. Yeah, but, but that's the direction that they're kind of going. You think what Apple's done, it's forced, uh, you've got the iPad apps that are a lot of them now are going web-based to get around their 30%. Mm. Well, uh, at least um, one online publication has done that. I don't know about anybody else, but yeah. They, uh, uh, I'm Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Amazon as well. They, they made the Kindle web reader uh, specifically to get around some of 
Apple's restrictions. Interesting. Mm. Um, and it works pretty well on Also, just, just adding us what, with things that Microsoft have done, uh, Flash is pretty much dead. Oh, no, Flash, Silverlight. Yes. Um, the Mono Project has stopped supporting it and said, basically, the it's not worth it, right no one's using it. run everywhere gone. was uh, a good dream, but it's not panned out the way they've seen it, and that's it. So there's another thing that they've killed. <laughs> <laughs> have you lost your... I, no, no, no. Right. I'll, I'll go into the next one, which yes. is my topic, is SKA, SKA coming to South Africa, news. which um, is quite awesome. Uh, basically, SKA, well, there's been several countries actually competing for it, which then got narrowed down to two, which is South Africa and Australia. Mm -hmm. Along with a bunch of c supporting countries, though, yes. right? So basically, to be able to vote, you, you had to have basically put or promised to put some money down for the project when it comes down. Um, so I know, like, I think Canada was a late entrant into this, but they put, put their money down. Uh, I, unfortunately, I just remember this, Canada, I know Italy was one of them, China was one of them. I know America's pulled out. I know, I think the UK, I, I don't know exactly all the people. I know just some of them. Um, but basically, they've been trying to decide between Australia and South Africa. I know they finally got the reports in and uh, all the documentation, and we've now been waiting for the decision. The decision was supposed to happen, I think, February sometime, mm -hmm. um, and then they delayed it just because of a lot of complications. Um, and in Australia, there was a slip out of the report, which shouldn't have happened, which basically showed that on a lot of the metrics, uh, South Africa won, Australia did win on some, but basically South Africa won the important ones. Um, and we they've now been waiting to see what happened. Now, the decision which everybody actually sort of expected to happen was that it became a shared win. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we got the lion's share. So we got uh, two-thirds two -thirds of it. Mm. And when they say two-thirds, it's basically it's broken up into three frequencies. So there's a high frequency, a medium frequency, and a low frequency. And uh, if I remember correctly, we've got the low and the, and the high. Low, low and the high. Okay. No, isn't it medium and high? And some of the low as well. Something like that. Well, average. I don't know. know. <laughs> I can't remember which ones we've got. We've got two of them. Yes. Um, but we're, we're going to have most of the dishes. So um, we're still going to be having dishes and all the supporting. So this is actually just spanning out throughout the continent. Uh, just to give more background of the SKA, it's not a square kilometer of dishes. It's the entire surface area. If you add the surface area of just the dishes, it adds up to a square kilometer. So, so th will that mean that it will be a square kilometer array if and only if you add up th the dishes in South Africa and Australia? Uh, I think so. Okay. So the Square Kilometre Array project is now going to be spread over spread two, over two con continents. Yeah. But look, even before this, it was going to be spread out from South Africa all the way up into Africa. Because yeah, yeah. basically they're creating a larger virtual dish by putting ones in lots of different places because it gives you better noise cancellation and things like that. Mm -mm. Mm. And what, what are the implications of, of um, splitting the, the project like they have? Um, you've got, it, look, there's going to be a greater cost. Because now you've got to build, like one of the things you've got to build is two supercomputers, uh, basically to, to process the data. And basically it's also to, as I said, there's a lot of noise. So to get all the noise and get the actual raw data that's actually the valid data out, you need to do a lot of correlation and processing of the data. Is there, did, I mean, do we need to lay another undersea cable directly to Australia no. to share the data? Uh, I've asked about how they're going to share the data. I I haven't got an answer yet. Okay. Uh, the person I was asking doesn't actually know that okay. answer. Uh, but uh, is there, I mean, do they need to share the data? Well, uh, all the data from this is publicly repository. available. Um, how they're going to be sharing it, I don't know. I know in South Africa we're going to be using uh, TNET. It's going to be available on that, which all the universities and including SKA mm -hmm. get free mm -hmm. access to. And TNET, and TNET has uh, capacity on the CECOM cable. Yeah, uh, at least as far as I know, that they've got other capacity as well. But I mean, that's um, so th there is international connectivity yeah. on that network. So, but we are talking huge amounts of data. I know we're going to have, a, a, I think, a lot of things in Cape Town to process it. Now, what it might be is that you will actually only look at the data from the antennas in here, and I was thinking, you know, you, you might even have to ship the hard drives across. Mm -hmm. so you are talking huge quantities of data. The co PCs that are going to process this data cannot be built now. Nice. Um, I love projects like that. IBM has yep. basically committed to build them, um, and they've, they've got like 10 years to do it. And they say, f you know, following the current trend, in 10 years, they can meet their commitments. Okay. Right now, if the, te the technology... Well, yes, I think, no, I think it's actually technologies right that do exist, but are not... haven't put it been put into mass, you know, large production and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, 
and there are theories out there. Uh, but in 10 years, they have committed and they will build this. And now, what if all the exciting stuff happens in the frequencies that Australia it won't. has? Um, each of those frequencies and stuff, I think, look at different things. Um, uh, as far as I know, basically what they're looking at is the, the radio waves that are coming from this. I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm a bit. But you, you've got the entire frequency band, and you actually look at different parts of the galaxy. And each of those parts is, is going to deliver, and there are things they want to look at and understand in those bands. So th we're going to be having tons and tons of stuff, and stuff we, we don't even know about, and there's you know, questions we don't know about. They will come out of each of those bands. Having said this, you know, we're getting quite excited. The first stuff will only start going and being built in the 2016. Just to, to put you, there's a lot of work to still go on. Having said that, the South Africa's already started, and so has Australia. Mm. I know from what I'm aware, we're a bit ahead of them. And that's <laughs> an added uh, bonus of having it shared as well, is you can build in parallel. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So there are also some advantages. Um, but we started with the CAT antenna, and then we're also now currently building Meerkat, uh, which will be incorporated finally into the larger one. But those are being built now. Um, so they will, and those ones have already been booked. They're only supposed to be finished in about three or four years. And they've already been booked for the following five years flat out. And <laughs> uh, that, that amount of requested of information that people want to look at. Um, so even those already, once they're built, will be the most sensitive radio telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere. Just to add something else, you want to be in the Southern Hemisphere because we look at the, the correct plane where most of the galaxies and stuff exist. So if you think the Milky Way and stuff, you can actually see better from the Southern Hemisphere than the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, wow. Which is one of the reasons that you want. Another reason why, I've got to get this right, the Karoo is better, keep on call it the Kalahari, is that um, it's actually, we, we're quite high above the sea level. So we actually get rid of all that dust and dirt and stuff like that. But it is. So I think it's about, I want to say 100,000 kilometers above, but I could be wrong. No, 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 it's not 100,000. No, it, no. it, it, might, it might even be kilometers. You may be thinking of meters. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Uh, but I know we've got quite quite a high elevation. And even then, the, the plateau, the high fault that we're on now, that's like 3,000 and some meters above sea level. And that's like a fairly high plateau. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is, we'll I speak kind of correctly. But I could then maybe it was 1,000. 1,000 meters or something. Which, which adds a lot. Yeah. So basically, you're looking through less stuff. Um, but it's awesome. It's very cool that we're going to be getting it. Yeah, yeah. Then there's something that uh, our teammate, Johan, dropped yeah, in yeah. for us. And it's really cool. Juan, Juan is helping behind the mixing desk. Yes. Yeah, he just wants to take a stab at those of us who actually like playing Diablo. <laughs> well, <laughs> when we can. <laughs> I've been playing Diablo without any problem. <laughs> that Sunday, I sat down to play. And for the entire Sunday, I got this Aero 37. Which is not, <laughs> sorry, you know, fail to log in. Is servers are too busy for you to be able to log yes, in. Yes, the servers are up, but boohoo for you. Yes. Yeah. So the first check is, can we see the servers? It's like, yes, and you get all excited, and it's, no, sorry, we can't let you log in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, by the way, is to play single player. Yeah, well, anyway. to play anything. You want to play anything? Log in, friend. Yes. Um, and uh, also, uh, just interesting to, to maybe point out, um, is that this shirt will cost you $20 overseas. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, 20 bucks on Split Reason. It's also available in South Africa. Where did we find it? Oh, uh, Dark Carnival. Yeah, Dark Carnival has it. 270 Rand. 280. Okay. Because the yeah. one I saw. I, I actually like the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> For the Diablo it, fans it, it, out there. It, it, it's almost as good as the other one that you, which, uh, that you said your friend had. Oh, I'm currently AFK. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, uh, wanted to mention that the servers were down this morning between three, uh, three in the morning and eleven. Hands How up, you know this because it was in breaking the breaking news section oh, okay. when I was playing last night. All it's right. actual a warning for scheduled maintenance. I couldn't believe it. Almost fell out of my chair. I think the problem is that it's usually unscheduled and not maintenance. Look, it's just it, fall it over. has gotten a lot more stable. They've gotten better. I know they're also apparently doing some rebalancing of the classes. Yeah. Uh, to get them right. Yeah, I don't know what they what they're doing. I just I know I, I'm near the end. I finally got myself there, and I keep on dying. So maybe the rebalances will help me a bit. Yeah, yeah. Or make uh, it harder. Comment from RC on the previous topic before we move on um, mm. is that uh, network supplying SKA is Sunren, not Tenet. Uh, you look confused, or you, yeah. look, you <laughs> look I dubious. could be wrong. I need to just okay. It. Cool. No, it could be Sunnet. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember Sunren being mentioned at least. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Just Moving along. Correct us before we get fan corrections. Yes. <laughs> Moving along. 
We have news from MultiChoice, is this right? Yeah, yeah. Compliance notice issued by the NCC. Yes, so uh, the NCC is the National Consumer Commission mm -hmm. and Commissioner, and it's an uh, institution that was put in place to serve the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, the Consumer okay. Protection Act actually specified this office. And um, the purpose of the Consumer Commissioner is to enforce the provisions of the Act, right? So if people step out of line, um, you know, she gets complaints, and um, she also gets to be proactive. And so she got into office, and she fired off a whole bunch of um, c uh, compliance notices. Among them, to our, pay our illustrious pay TV providers, Top TV and MultiChoice, and uh, or, um, on digital media and MultiChoice, and their various channels, DSTV platforms, as you said, DSTV and Top TV. For those who use those things, you know that they give you a bouquet of channels, mm -hmm. right? And so the compliance notice took issue with uh, the fact that you can't select channels individually. And it's something that consumers have been clamoring a lot for, but it's something that um, a lot of industry insiders have said is not practical. And I'll try to explain that as briefly as I possibly can. Another notice that the Consumer Commission fired off was to our ISPs, saying that uh, the, the we buy data in caps for people who are watching maybe overseas and going, what's a data cap? Um, uh, so which, which means we buy data by the gigabyte or by the megabyte. And well, I would imagine they understand it in reference normally to cell phones. To, to, to mobile, yeah, um, with, with um, unlimited plans going away and, and, uh, and so on. Um, but uh, we do that even on fixed line internet. A lot of people don't have uncapped internet connections. MWeb has changed th that uh, in recent times, but uh, up until recently we used to buy fixed line internet in the same way. Um, and so the Consumer Commission went, um, according to the Act, we read the Act to say that data needs to roll over for a period of three years. So for those who don't know, um, at the end of a month, your data expires. So you buy 20 gigs to use in a month, at the end of the month, if you, what, just what you haven't used, you lose. To explain where this legislation actually came out was to protect people buying vouchers from someone, let's say, a bookstore yes. or a clothing store, the way which says here's a voucher for 100 Rand, yeah, and the then it'll expire three months yes, later. The way that I actually understood that part of the act, and it seems I was wrong, was that it needs to be tagged to something physical. Um, you might not be wrong, because I've received um, not conflicting legal opinion, I've received legal opinion and then from the same person said, maybe the NCC has a leg to stand on, um, because um, there's a provision in the act which says that it must always be read to the benefit of the consumer mm -hmm. um, where there's dispute, right? So, but this lawyer um, from Michelson's, his name is Nicholas Hall, also told me that firstly, he sees it as something physical. And secondly, let's say it's not something physical, it refers to the, the voucher itself. So in other words, I buy a voucher for 20 gigs of data. The second I have activated that That's voucher, voucher um, it no longer needs to roll over. So the second it becomes active, a whole different set of provisions apply. No longer the original provision. Okay. So it can be a virtual voucher in your email. Yes. The second you enter that code, you're no longer protected by the act. Okay. Is basically the... For, for data well, rollover. I, I yes. still want them to start applying to the cloud train before they start playing, yes. applying it to I the I was I've, I've actually been wondering about that. Now I'm wondering even more. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so interesting. Now what's happened is that... Um, the, uh, this went to court, and the courts found that um, in the case of the, the, because they dealt with the pay TV operators first, mm. or DSTV, multi-choice specifically first, and they said that the compliance notice was issued illegally because multi-choice falls under the jurisdiction of ICASA, our regulator. And, um, and so uh, basically, according to another act, or maybe even the same one, I'm not sure anymore, uh, regulations of some kind, um, the NCC actually had to go to ICASA first and say, we have found one of the people falling under you to be in violation of the act. We want to serve this notice on them. Um, there's like a procedure that they have to ICASA follow. ICASA must then I, I don't agree. Or so isn't that just more red tape? Look, it's more red tape. I absolutely. must say in some of these things, it's, it's not feasible. I know with like the ISPs. Just in this case, it, I, I'm not sure that feasibility was tested. Like, if, if, if you can go, listen, ICAS is dragging its heels, which I'm not convinced it would, um, then you can say, sure, we want to bypass them. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm talking about the feasibility of the complaint. Oh. So, like with ISPs and yeah. with, without having that, if you say this thing has lost for three years, ISPs are going to go, this is just not worth it. Yes. I'm going to go bankrupt. I'm suffering and, 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 I'll, and I'll get to that. I know this, this topic's dragging on a little bit, but needless to say, all, um, the courts dismissed 
the, the, uh, uh, the notices as illegal. They didn't speak to the merits of the notices. They mm. only said that the notices, the pr were proper procedure wasn't followed. And the same, and the, the ISP Association of South Africa has come out and, and told its members publicly, listen, take note of this because you were probably issued notices in exactly the same way. So th this is not just Vodacom, Celsi, MTN. These are smaller ISPs, MWeb and those guys who also, are well, smaller, MWeb's massive, but um, you know, like the smaller ISPs, if you look at SA Online and uh, the, 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 the smaller players in the space, uh, I'm not sure which of them got compliance notices, but they're all at risk because they all offer services in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all these guys, the, the pay TV operators and the ISPs have said exactly what you've said, Tim that this is not feasible. It will break their business model. And in at least the short term, the consumer will be hurt. He will be paying higher prices to compensate for the fact that there's no longer breakage in yeah. the model. And similarly so for, uh, for DSTV. So the, the example I was given was, you can take five channels of your own choosing for say the 500 to 600 Rand a month, depending on how popular those channels are and, and what it costs to bring them to South Africa. So you can pay the same fee that you would for the full bouquet of 100 plus channels that you'll pay, that pay, you'll pay for taking 10 or less. Yeah. Um, so that's the, that's the trade-off. Um, if, you, if you implement the changes that the commission is talking about, uh, regardless of how, how valid they are in light of the, uh, in light of the, the act. Now, my obvious, um, thing, well my obvious concern or, or rather uh, complaint with, with the notices that were served was, and I understand that the, the commission maybe needs to pick low-hanging fruit, but I'm going, now what about telecom bundling voice, analog voice lines with ADSL service? Because the same principle, it's the same principle in the act. You may not require a consumer to buy one thing to get something else, is the basic principle in the act. I'm not, I'm not going to read you the, the boring legalese, right? But that's what I got from just reading the act and from listening to the lawyers speaking. Um, and yet they, they go after, you know, the pay, you know, places whose, I mean, it, if you look at those industries even a little, you'll see that it'll break the business model. And yet, if you look at Telcom, we've been fighting for local loop unbundling and naked ADSL. Um, you know, uh, you in, in no industry, thing. nobody is really fighting to have to Top TV and DSTV unbundled. Th there are some folks asking for it, but most people understand that it would break the business model drastically. Um, people are asking for more rollover, so when companies, th but and the operators are responding by launching products. So Celsi gives you a product that gives you three gigs for a year, um, and, and most of the ISPs, the even the prominent, the, the, the big ones, the so-called incumbents that are there to screw us, mm -hmm. um, offer similar products where the rollover is over a couple of months, or they give you a set amount of bandwidth, uh, um, sorry, data cap for a year. Um, cool. I'm actually going to follow through into my. Sorry, I'm going to skip. Sorry, Mixer, we're going to skip the topic. Isn't to. Um, there was quite a the fixing the internet in South Africa. So it just flows in quite nicely. Yes, with sure, it. sure, sure. Um, where they're talking about you know the things that need to be done um, in South Africa to basically improve. I think this was Arthur Goldstock who, who did this. Yes, Arthur Goldstock did a, um, a a presentation on his latest stats that was that was commissioned by Google. Uh, a study that was commissioned by Google. Um, and, and in there, he looked at all the things we need to do to improve. So you're talking about, um, and I know there were some articles on my board as well, where the, the ISPs are saying they need to drop the rates that telecom charges, uh, basically to connect the client to the internet. Where right now it says, it's basically you can go out and buy a, you know, a Salsi dong or whatever, 200 rand a month, and you connect it to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, okay, for 300, 200 rand a month, excluding the, the modem, but that gives you, what, 10 gigs. Uh, if you get to get uh, ADSL, you, you, you effectively you've paid 600 Rand, let's say, for a 4 meg line, and at that point you have nothing. You can't use it. Yes. And they're saying the lion's share of that money is going to Telcom, and it's A, stopping competitiveness, and it's, it's, it's stopping people from entering the market. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's hurting our fixed line industry, yes. and, and I'm sure Telcom is fully aware of this. Because they must be feeling it as well. I mean, they, they're looking at their own department like ATA, um, which looks far more attractive than their own fixed line offerings. So Telcom, um, I mean, to defend them a little, I know it's a very unpopular thing, but Telcom have stated categorically that um, there is a lot of cross-subsidization subsidization, subsidization happening um, to fund 
things like ADSL. So the, the copper line rental and, uh, and that stuff, you know, when we talk about naked ADSL, Telco have warned um, that if we do this, it's going to push up prices. And most of the folks in the industry who understand this, right, uh -huh. say yes in the short term. In the long term, it's going to encourage competition and hopefully, we're not guaranteeing anything, but hopefully it will drive down prices. So that's the trade-off we're making. It's almost a risk. We're going, give us naked ADSL, we'll take the risk of the short-term higher pricing, and we will hopefully through competition and making ourselves leaner through competition, drive that back down. Well, that's fine. I'm actually okay to pay more. I'd rather have more and not be getting a service I don't want. Because like right now, use. I've got a telephone line. I do not use it. So I'm forced to take a product. So I'd rather say, stop giving me that product. Stop, you know, let me cross subsidi subsidize and subsidize to it. To that point, wasn't there something you mentioned a bit ago about buying one product, buying one thing in order to get something else? Yes, so the bundling. But this is not what I was saying. Just like it breaks the business model, um, it, well, it, uh, I say it would utterly break the business model of Top TV and, and the ISPs. They would have to rethink how they do things completely. With Telcom, I, it, I, I wouldn't go so far as, uh, maybe it's unfair to Telcom because maybe I don't have a full understanding of how no, it works, but, but I wouldn't say it will break their business model, but it will drastically change in, the in way they need to pa In this example, the like you said, it might cha cost me the same amount. I'm or okay with... Because somebody has to pay for the... Inf remember, it's over the same copper line. Yes. So you need, to, you need to cover the cost of that copper line, and currently they do it with two fees. No, that's fine. So let's say if they increase the fee of my ADSL to the same amount pl as plus the telephone line. Mm -mm. And if I want the, the, the telephone line... The reason they say it might be more than that is because they are allowing competitors closer access to the end user and um, they lose their voice revenue. So if you do not take the voice line, they use the revenue from the voice. Talkum doesn't say this, by the way. This is just logic speaking. Um, uh, and, and industry insiders who refuse to go on record. Um, but they use voice revenues to subsidize the money that they lose elsewhere. Well, voice, vo in fact, voice revenues in this country, and the, and the mobile guys are on record saying this, subsidize a lot. They subsidize our mobile data to a degree. Um, and which is quite shocking because mobile data really isn't that cheap. Exactly. Um, and, and so one does t take this with a pinch of salt because and it comes straight from the industry, right? And considering that voice prices are busy dropping, especially on Celsius and Vodacom currently as a special and, and, and they're doing that. they're doing that on purpose. They, they're, they're doing that to try and win customers, and Vodacom responded because they knew what Celsius was doing. Yes. Um, and so got stopped. And, and, well, got stopped. They got forced to call it a promotion yes. instead yes. of a new tariff. Um, but uh, the competition needs to go there. And, and I think Alan Notcraig, who's taken over at Celsius, understands that, um, understands that, that, that voice has been a largely ignored area. People are battling in the data space, um, but, but the voice, but not so much in the voice. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to describe in a short period of time when we have to move on to other topics, but um, there's a lot of cross-subsidization happening for the infrastructure. I mean, our, our operators, our especially our larger network operators, are forced to roll out in areas that it is not profitable for them to roll out. And so they have to make their profits in the areas, so like um, mobile operators, for instance, call them golden towers. And those are the towers that make them a lot of money and and pretty much subsidize the towers they have to put in pits on the water. That would be the ones in Santon. Yeah, exactly. Santon, Rosebank. And that's why, by the way, you will ben find Moore. Neotel clamoring for local loop and bundling and facility sharing. They want to roll out in exactly two exchanges. Where Telcom wants to roll now once again, not to defend Telcom too much, right? Because understand that, that a lot has gone wrong at Telcom that's inhibiting growth in this country. Yeah. But Telcom is rolling out three thousand eight hundred M SANS over the period of the next let's say, seven or more years, right, to, to places where they might not necessarily make money off those MSANs initially. Um, obviously, they're going to roll it in the area that makes money Neotel, first. Neotel, Vodacom, and all the rest of it have the same requirements on them. Uh, not, not exactly the same requirements, but they do have similar requirements. They and it is, easier, it is easier to put up a base station to cover an area than to, than, to put, than to run copper or fiber wires into everybody's houses. Yeah. But I, I know Telcom in a lot of these areas is running wireless to, to the houses uh, to get around that. So yes. basically that, they'll yeah. do that. I right? mean, not that that doesn't have its own challenges. Getting uh, environmental approvals, and especially apparently I hear Vodacom in, at, at this thing with Arthur Goldstock, a uh, representative of Vodacom explained that they've got people begging them in Bryanston for better coverage um, and... And then in the same vein, they've got community, a uh, massive opposition 
from a different community in Bryanston who are of the, the tinfoil hat variety saying that it burns our trees and causes cancer. Yeah. Um, so you've got... You've not going to rant again. That, yeah, that, that you've got to work around, or, or not work around, but effectively punch through uh, as well, because those people aren't going to have their minds changed, and you just have to get the environmental approval somehow. Okay. Anyway, so we can keep on. There's a whole bunch more. We can carry on with this all this is night long. I can uh, see yeah, it. Yeah, and it, it is can. a deep topic, and we haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah. Um, yes. the, the guys in the IRC I see are talking about it, and that's good, because um, there, there are a lot of knowledgeable people in the IRC, people who have been on my broadband for yonks, um, and who know this industry or, or have yeah, seen uh, the and industry And I must say, we, we just work, out. well, I know I work pretty much on the periphery, so I, I, you think you know what's going on, but I know a lot yeah. of the time you actually have no idea. Yeah, mm. and, but, uh, and, and you know what, Tim, the, there are a lot of people who, who agree with you, and I agree with you. I would pay more for a naked ADSL service, um, you know, just because kind well, of thing. The I, see the, I see the long-term benefit. The only thing my phone does is allow marketers to spam me. It's <laughs> the so only time I get phoned. Is some guy trying to sell me something? That's how I feel about SMSs at this point. Yes. Kind of depressing. I, I get ba my bank SMSs. Yep, anyway. Yep. <laughs> uh, Doom 3. Moving along <laughs> to something a little bit happier. Doom 3 is not a new game. Anyone who knows about it's gaming not will a be able game. to... It's not a new game. No, no. It's definitely not. But what they're doing is they're taking Doom 3 to VR. And this is still id. It's working on this. It is the, the Verge had a hands-on. John Carmack invited them to come play in his uh, bat cave. John his Carmack, the godfather of Gib. That is the one. So what they have going here, and for those on the video stream or watching on YouTube, you'll see it on your screens. It is a heavily modified Oculus Rift. Um, so that, that's the visual set that you have going there. It's uh, two screens, 640 by 800 D each. Does this remind anybody of Lawn Mow Man? And if you don't, don't know what that is, you, you're too young. <laughs> I'm too young. I'm I have no young. idea no, what no, she's talking uh, about. I, I, I actually missed the whole Lawn Mow Man. So thing. it has two screens, 640 by 800, so 1280 by 800 so resolution, but one so for each So eye. he's got two smartphones strapped to his face. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> so think two Galaxy Notes sort of strapped <laughs> to his face. <laughs> And um, the, the guy says, you really have to see this in order to believe it. And I, I believe what he says. I actually want to experience something like this. And also, VR is not a new tech. No. Um, we've had this for quite a while. But what the, the challenges they've had is that you have loads of latency. And uh, the resolution is still low. Um, but it can get better. Uh, and even at this point, I it, it's I still I fairly I good I at 1280 by 800. Ten years ago, you could buy VR headsets. You could, but you couldn't actually play on that. The, the well, the you like could do something with it, and then it just sort of vanished. So it's kind of like trying to play Diablo 3. Your latency is just too high. So, so comment, a question from the yeah. RC is, when what you can makes this better than normal 3D? Normal 3D, um, that would be with your glasses. It's the immersion factor. So when you put these on, you almost have 90 degrees. If it, it's, it's so close to 90 degrees, you pretty much can't tell. You can't tell where the screen ends. So playing Doom 3 like this, you are completely immersed in playing Doom 3. And the guy, uh, it's not shown in the picture, but the, the controller is still a regular Xbox controller that he's using. But what do you mean regular? I played with a mouse and keyboard exactly. like a proper okay, FPS so gamer should. This is a bad FPS gamer, but you know, mouse and keyboard could be kind of tricky if you can't see where you're doing anything, where a controller would be a lot easier. But the, his head, the, the headset does have a gyro and an accelerometer in it. So you look like that, but you still move the gun and the actual mm. person that you're playing no. around with a controller. Mm. So this just immerses you so well. And because it's so responsive, it's actually semi-decent and low cost. Interesting. Well, low cost in what sense? Uh, low cost in a couple of hundred dollars, maybe. Okay, so so low cost ish. Low cost ish, but well, it's, low, low it's cost getting the others. better and better. Yeah, yeah. As but we now, go along. I mean, like it's obvious that that this is a prototype because they they slapped it together with duct tape exactly. and, what, and what looks like s like uh, scuba gear. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's to cancel out any kind of light bleed coming in and yeah, destroying but so, your so what factor. I mean, surely headsets like this exist. Yes, um, it's not the only one in its class, and a couple of people on the Verge that actually comment, um, and I, well, I actually want to want to try and find that comment. And okay, no, that's busy uh, so I was just thinking, if, if you take the modern screen stuff we're doing for our phones, right? They're dropping in price quite a, quite a bit. Yeah. Same Mo thing. And most of the cost is the rest of the phone. You know, they're a large component. Mm. So effectively, for the price of of a high end phone, you can build this. Yes. Well, that's that's what it's getting. A high-end phone plus another screen. Well, 
you don't have or you're not putting the CPUs in there or, or minus you don't, not that much you don't have CPU. all the radios um, and talking about screen tech I, I wanted to put this in uh, just as a quick aside uh, I think it's LG working on some really hectic um, 1080p screens for phones for oh like yes yeah, they, they, they came out so I mean that's feasible for something like this apparently it, it blows written display yes it no it, it. it does quite nicely um, so yes, it's not the only one that's available. This is, as you can see, it's a very, very alpha kind of prototype. But the other ones don't have, uh, again, the responsiveness that you need for something like this in a gaming environment. The, the other big problem with these, though, motion sickness. Maybe. For some people, it's the same kind of deal as with 3D. Some people complain with 3D glasses in a mo movie theater. It gives them a headache. And for me, it well, is uncomfortable at first. Eventually, I get used to it. Some no, people just the, the, don't These are like worse it. because in, in the movie theater, you, you still have things you can look around. This yeah. Everything is everything now moving. moves. Exactly. Um, so apparently, it exacerbates it quite a bit. So it'll just be interesting. I just, it'll be interesting to see uh, how much. I'm sure they wouldn't go forward with this, especially someone like John Carmack wouldn't go forward with something like this if he didn't see uh, a potential future. You, you need the one where you have the ball. The ball? Basically, you stand on a ball. And as you walk, the ball moves. Oh, okay. So as you turn around... So you put yourself in kind of a hamster cage. Effectively, but it's a sort of a... You, you're on the outside as opposed to the inside. Yeah, yeah. That would be okay, cool. Okay. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Quick moving, news. Moving along to some quick news. Telcom speed upgrades. Yep, are They're underway. Back. So um, we've, uh, we've received word from uh, a well-placed source that um, Telcom speed upgrades, which is bumping up their 384K DPS offering to oh, 1 okay. megabit per second, mm -hmm. um, and their 1 megabit per second to 2 megabit per second, and their 4 megs to 4 megs. Sh sorry, four megs sorry, get no. shafted if and we still If pay that the happens same. and the 4 meg price doesn't come down, I'm probably switching to 2 meg at yeah. that point. And, and it's actually an interesting situation because of the, if the 4 meg price, well, well the it just has to come down. Otherwise, yeah, I'm switching to 2 meg. Promise megs. you drop down, okay, with me once again, upload drops. Yeah. Uh, that, that kind of does depend for me as well. If the upload drops too drastically from where it is currently with 4 meg and what, 512 upload, if it drops too much, I'd probably stick with 4 meg. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, and so uh, the, the just to give an update here, um, Telcom's uh, doing its results in June, and we were expecting an announcement around that time, but it, nothing is cast in stone yet. We, we know All we know is that they are working on this. We're expecting the announcement to come with the results in June, but we're not banking on it just yet until our information is, uh, 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 like, not well, our information is concrete, but un until our source says that it's, it's okay. more concrete. Yeah, um, full. yeah. Okay. so just, just a quick update there. Cool. Okay. And the Galaxy S3? Has been launched, well, sort yeah. of launched in well, South Africa. Oh, just sort of. Th is this, this like the HTC me. being sort of launched? No, well, the HTC One X, I see people complaining about stock. Um, and, and there is a bit of a shortage of stock, but mm -hmm. it can be had. You just need to get through to the right person at MTN. Oh so okay. the HTC One X right now is just available on MTN, and the Samsung Galaxy S3 is only available on Vodacom contracts. Okay. And we should be quite glad because there, has, uh, there have been reports of stock shortages for the S3 overseas. Mm. So certain UK operators have said that they, they can't yeah. get any stock. And, and uh, yeah, I've seen, and I think O2 said they only have the 16 and the 64 gig version, no 32s. No 32s. We only have 32s. And there was <laughs> That's where they are, O2. Another UK Operators said that they just they they're going to get the white model a little bit later, but the the blue. Um, no, no, it's the other way around. They're going to the have the blue now and the white. No, 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 the blue later. Yes. Do do yes. we not have the a blue. little bit later? But no the blue one has is the blue. The the, the, the they apparently had issues with the coloring of the blue apparently, um, and so that's going to come in like two to three weeks. So all we have at the moment is the really ugly white. The marble white is what it's called. Yeah, I call I it I'm ugly. thinking of getting this phone. That's why I'm disappointed I can't get in blue. Yeah, yeah, the, the blue does look cooler. Um, yeah. I think. Agreed. Anyway, so it's 32 gigs. Um, we've got the contract. I'm not going to run through it all because uh, like it's, it's a lot of Vodacom contracts, three top-up contracts, um, and then a bunch of their uh, other contracts, including the, the business call, business call per second billing, and then all the way from, I think, the Talk 120 up to the Talk 1000. With the Talk 1000 for 1,500 Rand a month, get you the device for free. Um, <laughs> so Thanks, Vodacom. <laughs> yeah, that's the only one that has it for free, by the way. All the other ones you pay in. Not You can either pay in... Um, they d I didn't see any lump sum payments. Yeah, it's usually it's, it's you pay all for the financed. phone. Yeah. yeah, it's all financed over 24 months. You get 250 megs of data every month that's for the nice. full 24 months, yeah. which is uh, an, an interesting new development from Vodacom. Mm. Um, because I like that development. Yeah, the, their, their contracts used to be... 
only for the first three months. Yeah, and it used to be something ridiculous. Like it's 30 pointless. megs of data for the yeah. first three months, so, so it's pointless. This, You're was this wasn't else a, a cool development, uh, I think. Well, hmm. Some other nice things about this phone. It's the first one that's come out with an SD card. The one of the oh, first the high-end ones. High -end one ones, of the yeah. first high-end phones with ice cream sandwich with yeah. an SD card there's slot. A there's, there's a price you pay for that, and and uh, some people will gladly trade trade aesthetics for feature. Yeah. Um, but the HTC One X, and I've held both of these phones now. The HTC One X just feels like a m a, m a, a better built, a more yeah, well-crafted phone. Um, the 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 Samsung's just like other Samsung's feels plasticky. And that's the, also the cover peels off. Uh, I just don't like the way they do covers. That's also because of the removable battery, which the S3 has, the HTC doesn't. Yeah, um, but it's also a valuable feature. Yes, the yeah. both, but both of them are good. Well, like um, what somebody like was with saying, the, the Nokia with this one, you can upgrade to 128 gigs of storage. So of course, that, that is the, the, problem, the problem with that, and it's been mentioned on Reddit by Dan Morrill himself, is that uh, with that you have an interface problem. Um, you're not sure what's going where. So you have stuff on the SD card, but you can't really tell apps to go there. That's the reason they kind of split off from it with ICS. It's, it starts getting well, difficult. It's fine for no, tech no, but, but, but it's on, fine for on, tech on that people, one, the 64 gigs you can use for apps. Sure. Th right. That's what the that's why you move to a large amount of internal storage, yes. and then maybe with the SD card you use that for media files. Yeah. Or so movies, what I'm music, thinking about sort of is that's music, what I do with it. Um, uh, I, I use Spotify, which tells a lot of storage. Mm. Mm. Um, 16 gigs of internal storage, I think, is adequate if it's one block. I don't know if that's yes. how Samsung's done it. Yes. Um, for most people. Yes. I what, what I hope with the SD no, but I mean, and then with a the 64 gig add-on card. Possibly. Oh yes, yeah. Because I'm saying I have media. 32 gigs in my current phone. Well, so I need 32 gigs. Mm. What I'm hoping for with the S3 is that they didn't take the HTC route and, again, segment the internal storage space into this you use for apps, this you use for your stuff, where they go the way that the Galaxy Nexus went and that ice cream sandwich and actually Honeycomb before that um, tried to I is trying to do. Uh, you have one block of internal storage. Here's 16 gigs. That's for apps, movies, media, the lot. Just, just to just a quick reason, like the iPhone did from the start. Yes. <laughs> just checking. Yeah, yes. <laughs> like, like the file that system you can write to, hey? <laughs> yes, that's You too. can with an app, which I had to get to make Evernote work, which I'm g I'll do in another, in another, <laughs> uh, in another yeah, show. Oh, it's sort of because I'm quite upset with them because they had a whole thing with Dropbox where they got upset. And basically, I now can't store files from the web onto Dropbox anymore. Um, if they remove the functionality. And I think in, it's in what? So on the web browser before, I used to be able to save files into Dropbox because I have them sync wherever I needed to. I can't do that anymore. In Dropbox? Are we going to rant so about that? From a web, we're going to rant about so that from another time. Apple web, web browser, you click save file. Before, it didn't give you the options where you could save it to. One of them used to be Dropbox. It's uh, not I there see. anymore. On the iPad. I okay. see. Oh, now we, I'm we, with you. We, we can rant about page. that another day right now. I'm going to move us along to something cool with 3D printing. Tim? Um, okay, basically, 3D printing, it's, it's, you know, it's getting more and more with the MakerBots and all the rest of it. Um, I know I saw a demo at House for Hack where they've now got two 3D printers. And uh, I believe they're hooked up to an Android device. Uh, that I don't know. To Toby's been working very hard on, on those things. Okay. Um, but ba basically, I know they printed some claws out. We were there, which was awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, and we had this little claw thing that you could move and it Awesome. Um, but anyway, some guy went off and he built himself and he printed out and designed a lathe. Um, now, if you want to know a lathe, is, is basically uh, you... you Rotate objects, and you can use it then to basically make cylindrical objects, screws, and a whole bunch of other things. It's one of the key things you need, both for woodworking and metalworking and stuff like that. You make cylindrical thingies. Yes. Um, if you look like, okay, that's a bad example. I've never worked with one, so I don't. I know there's tons of things you can do with it. A lot of machine working and machines use them to build parts. So I know it's one of the very key things. But like, if you look at your table legs and the fact that you know they're large on the one and then they taper down that, that's all done with a lathe. Um, okay. And, and this lathe is completely made. Printed. It's completely printed. And working, and you basically you put a drill in the one side, yeah. and you start the drill, and it turns, and you can move it and backwards and forwards. Um, it's it's one of those key components, and now you can print it, which is just amazing. Mm. Uh, very cool. Uh, very cool to check it out in working thing. Go go check the video. It's in the show notes. Is there uh, the the spec for it? Is the spec open? Uh, I, I think so, I would imagine so. I, I must say, I didn't, I didn't look at that. Okay, I just watched the video really and it was cool. like, ooh. Must have. One 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the rip wrap, rip wrap can 
almost almost print itself completely now. And the main thing is also you need you need the cables and the plastic and all that type of stuff. So we need the bin where you can turn like uh, milk bottles and stuff. You know, there's ones that they're working on that can use that as their plastic, mm. and then you can really recycle and stuff like that. And they're not too expensive, so I think they're about five grand, and you can buy one. Mm, mm. Pretty cool. And I think the last topic for tonight: open source Bach project. Mm. Uh, Jan, did uh, you drop? No, I that was me as well. Was that Tim as uh, well? And basically, it's one of the things I picked up from Slasher. Was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's if I understand the project correctly, they're basically trying to get sheet music for all a lot of the old composers up um and this is pretty i know that the site that does the the music online the printing of it mm. uh sort of was a kickstarter project um, basically they're trying to get notation and sheet music uh for people for free because for a lot yeah. of this you've got to pay they say you know these things have been in the d the public, know, domain. public domain for so long your people are having to pay for it because they're getting the printed sheets and so part of it was was that um, and basically, then they also got together with a classical pianist, and they're also just getting the music online. Um, uh, CC, uh, what's it? Creative Commons, zero license, which means you can do whatever you want with it. Oh wow! Um, so I was going to tell the mix, and I forgot. You can actually play the music through the audio tonight, uh, and it would be allowed and perfectly legal, and all the rest of it. Um, also, in getting this specific music, it's like one of the last things. One of the big piece of music they've been trying to get on they had to upgrade the software to get uh, better notation in I started reading it I, I, I've never done music so I'm a bit clueless but they're talking about you've got to do weird things when you've got multiple instruments and how mm. you get around and violins and stuff like that and this thing this notation can now handle it um, and part of the wow. software which they also upgrade which is pretty cool is for people who can read music they're creating iPhone and iPad apps and Android I would imagine Android apps that basically if you go to a concert and they're playing and they've got the sheet music, it will follow on the sheet music as they're playing, showing you the pieces that they're playing. Awesome. That is impressive. That is very impressive. Yeah. That is very cool. That's very and that's a step up from, uh, I don't know, uh, when last you used something like uh, SoundHound, which uh, is, an, is an app that runs on, on a bunch of mobile devices that identifies music being played right mm -hmm. um, like and can now give you stuff like lyrics as well yeah. and I think Soundhound actually follows along the that's lyrics. what I wanted to get at yeah. now is that Soundhound actually drops you at the right point in the song's lyrics and follows along karaoke style Very cool. um, so this though blows that out of the water well I would imagine with this you know where what concert you're going to so it's not gonna it's not good digital uh, look eventually I imagine they're gonna build up the digital fingerprints to follow all this music so it's it's got a bit of a leg up and a bit easier to follow so you, you, you open the sheet music of what you're going to do. Mm. Um, and it has to still keep tempo, though. Yeah. Uh, with a concert piece, you're not guaranteed that they're actually going to be playing at that exact tempo uh, that's shown at the start yeah. of yeah. the music piece. So, But it is pretty cool. Uh, and then the nice thing, they've got a whole ton of music up there, which is, I say, Creative Commons Zero. Uh, you can reuse, resample, yeah, mix it's from your public phones. domain. Mm. Um, that's cool. And very cool. So you can go listen, and they have more things there as well. And on that note, Tim, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Let's Talk Network TV on the wiki quite a bit, in lots of other shows. And 94 shows. other shows, in fact. Yep, correct. Um, and several other random other bites but of news. Oh, yeah, the event shows and the quick news. Uh, so, so just yeah. look around there. Uh, also, uh, you can fi follow us, Let's Talk Network, on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, you name it. We're there. P please, please like us and follow us does make a difference. Did you just say please, please follow us? Yes. That's very pleading. I, I will repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> no shame. No. Uh, Jan, where can people find you? I'm a staff writer at my broadband, so Name I him. spend most of my online time there. But on occasion when I'm, uh, when I'm not uh, being worked to death, <laughs> I joke, don't fire me. Um, <laughs> Do uh, you play games by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> um, when, uh, but yeah, when I get a chance, I am on Twitter, at JanVZA. I'm also on Google+. Plus. Jan Vermeulen, look at the one with the ugly mug shot, click him and circle him. Um, yeah, that's basically where I hang online. Cool. And you can find me, Gerrit Vermeulen, at about.me slash hockeyza. Thank you for watching. <laughs>